Uh, our next speaker, um, Dr. John Holden, is a transplant hepatologist here at Indiana University with special interests on advanced liver disease. And I'll be honest with you, he's, he is an amazing clinician, and uh, he, he is a true advocate for quality patient care. I can, I can uh, testify for that. He'll once be again uh, pre presenting against the important foundation topic for us in interpretation of liver tests and the implications in AIH. Dr. Holden. We're going to wait until uh, the open question just to keep on time. All right, slide advancer is working. Hi, I'm, I'm John. It's really a pleasure to be here. I want to thank the AIHA and uh, Craig in particular for putting this on. It's uh, really nice to have all these patients and their um, caregivers and support members here, and uh, just uh, wonderful to see all the faces in the audience today. Um, Craig gave me the opportunity to, to speak a couple years ago at this conference, and it was really a pleasure, and I'm, I'm just really delighted to be back this year. Um, a couple years ago, he asked me to give a talk that uh, we called Liver 101, which is just kind of basics about the liver for um, patients and their caregivers, and uh, realizing that a lot of people in this audience have a, a good deal of knowledge already, Craig asked me to give a little bit of a talk more lines, along the lines of Liver 201 uh, at the conference today. And uh, my goal is to talk a little bit about the liver, uh, the functions of the liver, and some of the common tests that we use to assess um, the liver, not only its functions, but states of inflammation and, and other qualities of the liver. And hopefully we'll cover some of those things here in the next 20 minutes. Uh, so aims for today are to talk a little bit about basic liver function, review some common lab tests uh, for liver function, and note that function is in quotes there. And uh, I'll talk a little bit more about why that's in quotes. And uh, in addition, to talk about some of the common lab tests that we think about in the context of autoimmune hepatitis. Uh, the good old liver, uh, as many of you know, sits in the right upper quadrant of our abdomen. It's reddish brown, sits right next to our stomach and close to the intestines, and it, really a wonderful organ that performs a variety of functions. Uh, in the normal person, it's about 15 centimeters from north to south and weighs about three pounds, so about two to three percent of our body weight. Our understanding of the liver has evolved a great deal over time, and you'll see two pictures here on your screen. On the left, an image of Hippocrates, who's the father of medicine from ancient Greek times, and on the right, a picture of Galen, who is a Roman physician of some fame. I put these up there to give you a little bit of context of where our understanding of the liver function has come from and how it's evolved over time. Hippocrates, in ancient days, uh, thought that the body was governed by four humors, which at that time were known as phlegm, blood, yellow bile, and black bile. And uh, it was thought that these humors uh, helped establish the function of the body and that diseases occurred when the body was out of balance with regards to one of these humors. Hundreds of years later in Rome, Galen would propose a uh, theory of medicine in which it was thought that three organs helped govern these four humans, the brain, the heart, as well as the liver. And the liver in particular was thought to be the source of all the blood in the body and all the blood vessels. Um, as you may realize, we've come a long way in terms of our understanding of liver function, and I'll go over that a little bit. Uh, up on the screen here, you'll see a map, and it's a little bit blurry, and there's a lot of things going on the screen, uh, but what this is is a map of the human metabolome, all the metabolic functions that are performed in the human body. Uh, this is too detailed for anybody to read, and that's on purpose. Uh, this is a simplified version and looks a little bit like a subway map, and uh, I don't know to you, but it's still pretty complicated by my standards. Uh, but I put this up here just to give you a little bit of an idea of the complexity, again, of uh, the function of the body and the uh, human metabolism in general. But to make one important point, which is that you see all these nodes up here, all these lines, uh, uh, kind of lines and uh, notations, and, and what I'd just like to point out is that the liver uh, serves as an important organ in, in the, uh, most of these processes. Um, and we'll talk about some of these. So what does the liver actually do? Well, it does a lot, and, and I'll try and cover a lot of these things with the brief time that we have. One of the important things that the liver does is it processes and maintains 
uh, levels of glucose, fatty acids, and amino acids in our body. So one of the things that uh, the liver does is it helps maintain our levels of glucose. So it performs a role in what we call glucose homeostasis. Uh, when you have excess glucose in your body, it stores it in the form of glycogen in the liver. And when your blood sugars or glucose are running low, it breaks down glycogen to maintain your glucose levels. It plays an important role in the storage and processing of fatty acids. And it plays a key role in the synthesis and breakdown of amino acids to form the proteins that are part of the building blocks of our body. In addition, the liver store, serves as a warehouse for many important molecules, including not only glycogen, but important vitamins, such as vitamin A and B12, for which it stores many years' worth of supply in most patients, vitamin D, for which it supplies, uh, stores approximately several months' supply, and it also plays an important role as a storage site for important minerals, such as iron and copper. In addition, the liver synthesizes a lot of important key molecules in our body, including albumin, which is an important protein component of our blood, clotting factors. Without the liver, we couldn't form blood clots, which we need to keep ourselves from bleeding on a daily basis. And it also helps synthesize cholesterol, which I think often we hear about cholesterol and think about it in a bad way, but it's important to realize that cholesterol is a key in, a molecule in our cell membranes, and without it, our cells couldn't do their basic functions. In addition, the liver is a detoxifier for our blood and removes important toxins from our bodies by adding electrons, removing electrons, adding hydroxyl groups to them, and then adding additional molecules through conjugation pathways, adding sulfur groups, glucuronide groups, acetyl groups, so that these toxic molecules can be eliminated from the body, uh, either through our bile and the liver, or so, uh, in some cases through our kidneys. In addition, the liver provides a, an, uh, plays an important role in digestion with the synthesis of bile. Uh, what is bile? Um, so bile is a collection of different molecules. Uh, it includes bile salts, which are synthesized from cholesterol. Uh, it includes bilirubin, which is a breakdown product of our blood, some of these toxic chemicals that the liver has detoxified. And what happens with bile is that it's secreted by the liver stored in our gallbladder, and when we digest food, it enters into the small intestine, and the bile helps solubilize or break up the fats in our food so that our body can absorb them and then use them. Um, and so it plays a really important role in our digestion. In addition to that, the liver also synthesizes and plays a role in the metabolism of some other key molecules including hormones, and also plays an important role in our uh, body's immune system. Uh, this is just a picture of the growth hormone pathway. It's important to note that the liver plays a role in the synthesis of a molecule called IGF-1, uh, without which uh, we wouldn't have a functioning growth hormone pathway. Liver also plays a key role in the synthesis of a molecule that's not up here, but called thrombopoietin, without which we couldn't synthesize platelets in our body, and again, platelets in addition to uh, clotting factors, play a critical role in our ability to form blood clots. In addition, the liver synthesizes key immune molecules and proteins. It serves as a reservoir for a lot of immune cells, and it synthesizes proteins without which we couldn't fend off infections. So uh, just to summarize, the liver does an awful lot, and it does an awful lot of varied things. And, and as you all know, I think the liver is an important organ. And um, as a hepatologist and someone who studies the liver, we try to do our best to assess how the liver is doing in our patients. Uh, as I go on to talking then about liver function tests or liver enzyme tests, uh, I'll just make a general caveat to say that our ability to measure the liver's function in many cases is actually quite crude in comparison to the many functions that we've just talked about. Now, for many of you who've seen printouts of liver numbers or liver function tests is often printed out uh, and that you may have seen from your doctor or have at least discussed with your doctor, I'd like to make a general caveat that while these are sometimes listed or named as liver function tests, the tests themselves might better be described as liver enzyme tests or liver biochemical tests because not all of these numbers or tests actually directly reflect the function of the liver. Uh, 
there are many things that you may be used to be seeing or reviewing with your doctor, including values called ALT, AST, or alkaline phosphatase. And I'd like to take a, a quick second to talk a little bit about what these things are. So ALT is an alanine aminotransferase, and AST is something called aspartate aminotransferase. What is that? Well, these are just enzymes, and these are enzymes that play a key role in the synthesis and breakdown of amino acids, which of course are critical components of proteins. <coughs> What's notable about these enzymes is that ALT is predominantly, though not completely, located within the cells of the liver. AST will also, uh, predominantly in the liver, it can also be found in a number of other tissues throughout the body, including muscles, uh, such as skeletal muscle or the heart, but can also be seen in the kidney or brain. The importance of uh, these enzymes when it comes to our thinking about the liver or monitoring of the liver is that they are markers of liver injury or markers of liver inflammation and not necessarily liver function. Uh, as we think about autoimmune hepatitis, we tend to pay careful and close attention to these values because autoimmune hepatitis is a disease characterized by inflammation and inflammation in the liver. And so monitoring the ALT and AST tell us some information about a state of the inflammation and the degree of activity of autoimmune hepatitis in the liver at any given time. Alkaline phosphatase is another enzyme. It is a phosphatase, which means that it removes phosphate groups from uh, different compounds within the body. It's located within the liver, but it's also located in a number of other places throughout the body, including the bile ducts. Uh, it's also found in the kidneys, the bone, and in pregnant women can also be found in the placenta. It's important to mention that just because when alkaline phosphatase is elevated on liver panels, we have to always ask the question, is this coming from the liver or coming from another source? Uh, when we think about autoimmune hepatitis, we tend to focus a little less on the alkaline phosphatase just because it uh, tends to be not quite as elevated in some cases as the ALT and AST. If we think about liver function tests then for the liver, we do have some crude measures for the function of the liver. And in fact, these measures uh, mostly reflect the synthetic function of the liver. And these tests are, are commonly seen on some liver panels, including bilirubin and albumin. And there's another marker called INR for which uh, some patients are measured as well, but isn't always on uh, normal liver panels. So what are these things? So bilirubin is a molecule that's derived from the breakdown product of red blood cells, and in particular, a molecule called heme. Heme is one of the main components of red blood cells. It's the oxygen-carrying component of red blood cells. And as the red blood cells turn over in the body, they release heme which is transported to the liver, and the liver modifies the heme molecule by conjugating or adding components to it uh, to form the molecule called bilirubin. And we've talked a little bit about bilirubin as a component of bile. Um, bilirubin is notable because when the liver uh, fails to process the bilirubin well, bilirubin levels tend to rise, and rising bilirubin levels can be a sign of impaired synthetic function. Uh, Clinically, we note bilirubin levels sometimes in the form of yellowing of the skin or jaundice. Albumin, which we talked about a moment ago, is one of the key proteins in the blood. It's synthesized by the liver. And as such, it is a marker when we check its levels as a, a marker of function of the uh, synthetic ability of the liver. Though it should always be noted that uh, it can be affected by a number of other things, not just the liver synthetic function, but by states of inflammation in the body, as well as the overall nutritional well-being of the body. INR is a lab test that measures the clotting function of the body. And because the liver synthesizes many of the body's clotting factors, uh, it can be a helpful measure of the synthetic function of the liver, as elevated uh, INR levels uh, tend to reflect uh, decreased numbers of clotting factors, which can reflect impaired synthetic function of the liver. Uh, so these tests are sometimes things that your doctor may measure and sometimes I as a hepatologist keep an eye on. But I'll give a little bit of a caveat is these are not necessarily always sensitive tests for ongoing processes in the liver. And some of these values may not be affected except in severe disease states. Um, just to give a little bit of context for uh, some of these things, I think 
many in the audience may be used to seeing various values of uh, some of these liver enzyme tests or liver function tests. Uh, these are some of the reference ranges that we use at IU Health. It's important to note that these reference ranges vary from one lab to another. Uh, so depending on where you're getting your labs drawn, you may see different values. Uh, but I think it's helpful to have at least a little bit of a basis of what's normal. That being said, uh, please know that uh, normal has a little bit of variability. These ranges reflect 95% of the population. Uh, there are variations in normal according to age and gender. And uh, there's a little bit of debate, particularly within the hepatology and, and other communities, as to what the upper limit of normal for things like ALT and AST really should be. Um, we're here for the Autoimmune Hepatitis Association, so uh, we should talk a little bit at least about some of the liver tests that are specific to autoimmune hepatitis. And if we do that, I think it's worthwhile to spend a few minutes talking at least a bit about immunoglobulin levels as well as some of the autoantibodies that are seen in autoimmune hepatitis, including antinuclear antibodies, smooth muscle antibodies, uh, liver kidney microsomal antibodies, and things like uh, soluble liver antigen. Uh, so what are these things? Uh, so immunoglobulins, quite simply, are antibodies. Um, in autoimmune hepatitis in particular, we're often interested in following a particular type of these called gamma globulins, or IgG levels. And um, worth taking a quick second to explain why that is. Uh, one of the main reasons is that um, what we know is that one of the hallmarks of autoimmune hepatitis is an increase in immunoglobulins, particular IgG levels. And so elevated IgG levels serve as an important component as we try to make the diagnosis of autoimmune hepatitis in patients. But importantly, it not only serves a role in uh, making the diagnosis of autoimmune hepatitis, but can play an important role in monitoring the course of the disease in patients. Uh, elevated IgG levels, or gamma globulins, are associated with ongoing inflammation. And as we think about treating autoimmune hepatitis, we like to monitor these levels. And good treatment responses in patients with autoimmune hepatitis, we think, correlate to low or normal IgG or gamma globulin levels. There are a lot of autoantibodies that have been associated with autoimmune hepatitis. Uh, these include things like ANA, or anti-nuclear antibodies. These are antibodies that are directed towards the nucleus of cells. Uh, another common antibody are smooth muscle antibodies. These are antibodies directed towards components of muscle, in particular uh, components such as actin or desmin. And it's notable that uh, these autoantibodies, ANA and ASMA, are, tend to be positive one or the other in about 95% of patients with autoimmune hepatitis. Liver kidney microsomal antibodies are antibodies directed towards microsomes or components of the mitochondria, which are kind of the power factories of cells. Uh, these tend to be seen predominantly in pediatric populations, though they can be seen in adult populations. Uh, one thing that's notable about these autoantibodies is that uh, while they're important and they uh, are useful in helping to make the diagnosis of autoimmune hepatitis, the titers or level of these autoantibodies do not necessarily correlate with disease activity. So in most patients, after a diagnosis of autoimmune hepatitis has been made using these autoantibodies, we don't tend to monitor them too much over time just because from the research that uh, has been done, we don't notice necessarily that they provide us with a lot of additional value about the course of the disease over time. Uh, one exception, at least, that I'll mention is that, though rare, there is one type of autoantibody called soluble liver antigen. And it's notable, um, uh, in some degree, and, and separate from the other antibodies, is um, it does provide a little bit of uh, prognosis in some of these patients. And when we see this particular autoantibody in patients, we take a little bit of note of it just because it does tend to carry a little bit more of, um, uh, carries more prognostic value. And what I'll say is that patients with soluble liver antigen tend to be a little harder to treat, or at least there's some data to support that. 
that's it. Um, it's a lot to cover. Um, there's a, a lot more that could be said about liver enzyme tests and liver function tests, and we could talk about those things in great detail. But I wanted to bring these things up, give a little bit of refresher for people, a little bit of an introduction to the context of these things is autoimmune hepatitis, uh, so that can serve as a foundation for some of the other things that you'll hear today and uh, throughout the weekend. Uh, so thank you, Craig, and uh, thank you all for being here.